I remember one experience. Debbie and I ran away from home one Saturday, and we were driving around Putnam County, and we came into Western Montgomery County to the town of Alamo. How many of you have you ever been to Alamo? You've been to Alamo. You know what I'm going to talk about, Roland, because when we came in from the south side, there was this huge impo imposing building, uh, well built. It was concrete. The roof had fallen in, and I thought, my gosh, that's the high school gym. And and I I stopped. I went in there and looked, and it was poured concrete. And I thought the WPA had to build this gym. They had to. Somebody had some political pull in this in this community to have the crew come and build such a solid imposing structure that was falling into disrepair, but it happened. And, and my memories went back and I thought, oh, the games that have been played there, uh, what excitement. Uh, did they ever win a sectional? Uh, can can any, any of you ever remember when your high school won a sectional? <laughs> that's, that's a memory that stays with you. I remember the big snowstorm that we had. People were stranded. The sectional was held at Clinton Central. And my dad took our Super M tractor over there and pulled people out to get them home. How many of you know <clears throat> that in the consolidation of Clinton Central, there are two coaches that had a unique connection to this man? One gentleman was Ray Kraft. He was, he was my phys ed teacher and the coach and played with Rollin Cutter on that 1954 team. The other gentleman preceded Ray Kraft was named Gene Flowers. Now, now you know Gene Flowers and Gene, uh, I asked Rollin about him. Jim, did you know Gene Flowers? Yes. Gene Flowers played for the Muncie Central team in the championship against Milan and Clinton Central, Clinton, Michigan Town, Indiana. Two greats of the game coached there. And unfortunately, I was too young to know any better. There is a, Ron brought some pamphlets here. And see if you can pick out which one of these men in this picture is Roland Cutter. <laughs> So our speaker today spent his early years and, and graduated from Milan High School. He then went to Butler, played for Tony Hinkle, and spent his life, his career, as a high school administrator, uh, not all the time in Noblesville, but, but a good portion of it. He and his wife have traveled here today. They are, my connection to these folks is through my mother and father-in-law, and when Debbie and I first started dating, I heard Roland and Meredith Cutter stories. And so I thought, I've got to meet this man. Um, have him show you what's on his right hand ring finger. Uh, and when he holds it up, that has a significance. I said, I've got to touch that ring the first time. I did it. I've got to. And so he took it off, and I slid it on my little old, and huge hands. Look at the hands on this man. They're, they're huge. So it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Rollin Cutter and his wife, Meredith. Let's give them an eye. Thank you, Parker. <laughs> You're welcome, pal. Oh. He will, now, after he's talked, he will entertain questions from you folks, and there's no time limit on this, so. I, I, I have to use notes only to keep me organized. Uh, I, I know the story, and I know how to tell it and all of that, but sometimes I get the horse before the cart, you know, and, and uh, so uh, once in a while I have to look down and see where I am, okay? Thank you, Louis, for uh, that introduction. First time I met this guy, he, he went crazy. He said, oh, let me see your hand, you know? <laughs> and, and so that was outside of your home. If you ever, I remember your garage that nice sunny afternoon. We did that. Uh, then uh, 
we met over at Michigan Town at that, uh, that angry donkey thing. Hey, what a nice place that is for a small town. But, uh, you know, he came up with this idea of coming to talk with you folks today. And that was last fall, I believe, correct? And uh, so uh, that, that's how this all came about. Uh, you know, I had uh, mixed emotions coming in today. As I drove into town, I, I got to thinking of uh, some of the negative things uh, or one of the negative things that I can think about Frankfurt. Uh, picture myself back at, at 15 years old, uh, riding into town, uh, ready to play a basketball game on December 26, 1953. Uh, I was a sophomore, 15 years old. Uh, we were driving into town to play a holiday tournament against Frankfurt High School. Uh, Frankfurt, Columbus, Fort Wayne Northside, and Milan were in that tournament. So, uh, uh, and our, our goal that day was to play Frankfurt. Well, we had uh, been undefeated at that point, and uh, when we left town that afternoon, we were not. Uh, we lost the game by one point. And uh, maybe somebody knows the Ulm family here in, in Frankfurt. I see some heads shaking, yay. Well, uh, he played a whale of a ball game that day, and we got defeated by one point. So, uh, you know, that, that takes away our, our undefeated season. We didn't really think about that. We just thought about playing good basketball. Uh, it was a good ball game. So... Uh, that was a negative feeling. And then the other feeling that I had was uh, to uh, visit with these folks that, that uh, Louie mentioned, uh, Eve and Ted and uh, whatever, when they moved up here, uh, it was nice to come up and visit with them. So uh, uh, we did that. Uh, my wife, Meredy, is with us today. Uh, she's my right-hand person. Uh, she's probably responsible for what I am today because uh, she gives me instructions all the time. And, uh, uh, but uh, we're going to be celebrating uh, our 60th wedding anniversary uh, this summer. And uh, so uh, she's been my partner all this time, and uh, she also was a fellow teacher uh, and, uh, and a classmate. So we've known each other probably 75 years. So, uh, you know, uh, that's just the way it is, okay? But we, we, uh, I think we make a pretty good team. When I come to Frankfurt, I think about the four state championships that Frankfurt High School won and the one runner-up that they had. And I think about uh, a gentleman by the name of Everett Case. Uh, I, I not only played basketball, I tried to coach basketball for a while. And Everett, coach, Everett Case was a tremendous coach. He had to be. Uh, in a period of uh, 15 years, he won four state championships and a runner-up. And from here, he went on to uh, eventually, uh, I'm not sure he went directly to North Carolina State and coached there. The man is in uh, three Hall of Fames, the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, the uh, ACC Hall of Fame, and the Naismith Hall Basketball Hall of Fame, uh, responsible for probably the ACC, the Atlantic Coast Conference basketball, well, athletic conference that uh, is in, uh, well, they are now the basketball elite, which includes Duke and North Carolina, North Carolina State, uh, all of Virginia, and all of those teams that are, are very good this year. <coughs> So uh, Everett Case had a background here before he went there. Now, I'm not sure what background he had before he came to Frankfurt, but he did a great job. And the community of Frankfurt should be proud of the people that uh, played basketball for them. Maybe you are related to some of those people who played on the Frankfurt hot dog team back in the 20s and 30s. But uh, you should be proud of that. Basketball did not originate in Indiana. It wasn't born here. It was born in, uh, actually in 
in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Now, I usually uh, give a little background there because Indiana, some of you folks are not from Indiana. But when you came here, probably uh, the second sentence out of someone's mouth was, oh, we're moving to Frankfort, Indiana. And, and someplace in the first or second sentence was, oh, that's basketball territory, right? Okay, well, that's, Indiana is responsible for the tradition that we have today in basketball. Even though it was born in Springfield, Massachusetts at a YMCA there, it came to uh -huh. Indiana by way of YMCA at Crawfordsville. Now, what happened at Crawfordsville was the YMCA there, Crawfordsville is not a great big town, it's about the same size as Frankfurt now, but think back in the 1890s, and it was probably much smaller than it obviously it is today. So not only were the people in Frankfurt, uh, or pardon me, pardon me, in Crawfordsville attending that YMCA, but a lot of the small towns around there, you know, and there were lots of small towns. But to make a long story short, basketball ended up, after it started there, in those little small towns. Every little town in Indiana, practically, back then had a school. And so they, they ended up setting a court up in a, in a regular classroom, putting a peach basket or a basket rim on this side, a rim on that side, and, and playing ball. It got to be where one town was rivaling another. They became, uh, it, it became it knocked down drag out. And this was the way that they were proud of their own town by, by uh, the, you know, the town of Wingate and Linden and all of those little towns surrounding Crawfordsville. Uh, you know, they were bitter rivals. I remember how it was when, when uh, in Ripley County when I played. It was the same situation then, and that was in the 50s. But uh, that's how basketball got started. So from there it bloomed out. It's almost like dropping a rock in a, in a, uh, a pond that's, that's kind of calm and quiet, and, and it just kept going, it, the, the ripples kept going out. So it took a, a few years, the first basketball championship in Indiana at, at the high school level came in 1911. So it took a few years to reach Frankfurt, but when it did, it hit pretty hard right here, okay? So uh, you folks are, uh, are responsible for that and uh, should be proud of that. But uh, that's the, uh, the basketball story. Uh, so let me finish that little comment about a couple of things. We, we not only had good basketball teams, which, which included, of course, good players, but we had good coaches, and we mentioned Everett, Everett uh, Case, and you had uh, my coach, Tony Hinkle. You know, you had the Branch McCracken, the Piggy Lamberts, and, uh, you know, and, and all those people around, and, and that even grew from there. But you also had fans, and, and fans crowded into small, squeezed into small gymnasiums on a Friday and Saturday night to watch their basketball team play and root for their basketball team. And uh, so that's how basketball started. So all those fans, you know, crammed into there. The uh, Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame put out several years ago a little uh, little ditty that said, 15, this is, this is really interesting, 15 out of 16 largest high school gymnasiums in the world are right here in Indiana. 15 out of 16, that, that, that case arena over here is probably one of those, okay? But you tell Newcastle and Marion and Anderson and Kokomo and Lafayette and, and uh, Seymour and Washington and, and all of those. And where? Newcastle. Newcastle is the largest. Almost 10,000 people. Uh, so... All of those were built in the 1960s and 1970s. 
maybe some were started earlier than that, but uh, back then, school corporations could build buildings a whole lot better than or easier than they can today. But so they built big gymnasiums. And uh, so, you know, th that's an alarming figure, 15 out of 16. Okay. Uh, Milan. So you came to hear the Milan story, okay? How in the world, well, first of all, Milan. You know where Milan is? Ripley County, uh, which is about one, one uh, county over from Ohio line and one county over from or up from the Ohio River and Kentucky. So we're down in the southeastern part of Indiana off a of highway or Interstate 74, about 10, 12 miles off the interstate. Milan, what's the county seat? Of county seat is Versailles. It's Ripley County, bunch of small towns, okay? Batesville is the largest town and it sits right on the edge. So uh, that's, that's where Milan is. Milan had uh, in 1950s, probably if, if you counted several of them twice, you might get to be a thousand. So it was rather small, okay? Compare that to uh, communities around here and the only thing I can think of quickly would be Thorntown maybe about the size of Thorntown. And by the way, Thorntown went to the Final Four a long time ago as well, okay? So they had the history. Remember that rippling effect? Uh, so Milan, uh, we had a school population of 160. And how in the world did a bunch of kids from this little town, surrounded by many farms, beat teams like Muncie Central, Crispus Attucks, Lafayette or well, Lafayette or Terre Haute Gerstmeyer, who had had uh, a large were came from a large city, and also from a school population of uh, 1,500 to 2,000 students. How in the world did this happen? Well, several things happened that I can go back and think about. Number one, if I, when I was in the third grade, when we had recess, you remember recess? <laughs> well, it was it was chaos, but uh, you know, but <laughs> hey, we had fun and we deserved it, right? Okay. <laughs> but uh, we had recess, and once in a while we get to play in the gymnasium. Not very often, but once in a while we did. And every time we did, there was always a pickup basketball game along with about 40 other kids out there on the floor. It was, there was no officials or anything like that. They, all, they was self-regulated and all, but it was always the fifth graders against the sixth graders. I remember that, third grade. Uh, I remember it for, for another reason because my brother was a, fifth, a sixth grader and he was on the sixth grade team and they could never beat the fifth graders, never. Uh, never did happen. Matter of fact, they even went so far as to bring me up from the third grade to the sixth grade team to play against the fifth graders. <laughs> and, and obviously we lost, okay? <laughs> but, you know, they, they would try anything to beat, you know, when you're a sixth grader, you, you know, you're hot stuff. Uh, you, you know, you're the king of the hill because you're now in the upper elementary. And uh, so that, that's one thing. The fifth graders had a bunch of good athletes. They were not only good basketball players at that level, they were also good uh, baseball players. We didn't have football. They were good baseball players. Uh, they were good marble players. Good mumbly, mumbly peg players. Remember mumbly peg? Huh? I do. Uh, we, we were allowed to carry a little knife along, you know, and we could play mumbly peg with it, okay? Uh, one of the players that on that fifth grade team had, had a bag of marbles was, well, uh, I would die for almost. Uh, was a great... I mean, he'd carry them around in a, in a bag that you could see what colors they were and how big they were and all that. 
and, and I would never get into a game with him. I was smarter than that because <laughs> I knew what would happen. I'd lose my marbles. <laughs> and he would have them in his bag instead of in my bag, and I wasn't going to do that, okay? So, you know, these guys were good athletes, fifth graders. When they get to be seventh grade, for the first time, we now have a coach. Before that, there was no coaches, okay? And there was no AAU, no Little League, uh, or anything of that nature. Uh, it was the only time we had a paid coach and somebody who would, would actually take these guys, and, and that's what happened. We had the greatest seventh, eighth grade, we called them uh, junior high, or no, we didn't. We called them uh, grade school. We had the best grade school coach, I think, in the world. He, he taught us fundamentals, taught us teamwork, he, he taught us, you know, how, uh, many things. We admired the guy. But we learned basketball. We learned how to play as a team at that level. The next little thing up the way is uh, when these guys were 10th graders, uh, we had a game scheduled with Osgood. Osgood is our rival 10 miles away. And uh, like I told you a while ago, the, these small schools, they were great rivals. Well, Osgood was a rival. So Milan goes to Osgood to play a basketball game. I was an eighth grader at that time. We get there and, and uh, it, their small gym, it wasn't even as large as this uh, venue that we're in right now. Uh, Milan was behind at halftime almost 20 points. Now, we had a protege of, uh, of Branch McCracken who, run, who played uh, run-and-gun basketball. I call it run-and-gun basketball. It's almost like the run-and-gun football that they play. But uh, in other words, you know, up and down the floor. That's why they call them hurrying Hoosiers, right? Well, that's the, the style that, that, Oz, that Milan played at that time. And we were behind almost 20 points. The coach got upset at halftime and said, hey, guys, if you not you're seniors, you seniors, and there were about six of them on the team. If you can't do any better than that the second half, you might as well put your uniforms on the floor at the end of the game because you won't need them anymore. It was a motivational thing. Didn't work. <laughs> Didn't work. At the end of the game, it was more than 30 points, okay, difference. And he was true to his word. All the seniors laid their uniforms on the floor and he collected them. And uh, so what did that do? That gave those, those 10th graders a couple, uh, a, little, a chance for experience. And they took advantage of it. Now he was smarter than that as well. Okay, he invited two of the seniors back who were his best ball players and kind of infiltrated those guys together and they ended up playing pretty good basketball the rest of the year. That's when they were 10th graders. The next little step along the way that I can remember that was one of the reasons why these bunch of little guys can play the, with the big guys was uh, that summer. Now, I grew up on a farm five, almost five miles out of town, and, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, cell phones then, and, and uh, so... Information didn't travel, communication didn't travel too fast, but the word came that the coach was fired. Uh-oh, he was very well-liked, everybody respected him, he lived in the, uh, in the community, had been the coach for 10, 12 years. What happened was, one day in the superintendent's office, here comes a couple of big boxes, they open them up and they find a new set of uniforms. And the coach, his name was Herman Grinstead. The coach uh, was called in and said, uh, you know, hey, where'd these come from? You asked for these and we said we could not afford them. We can't pay those. We can't pay for a new set of uniforms. So in the, in the communication between the two of them, the superintendent won. He fired the coach. And that, that yeah, raised uh, everybody's ire as far as the, uh, 
the, the town was concerned, so we need a new coach. So they go find, try to find a coach, and they ended up hiring a guy that, two years out of college, graduate of Butler University, went to French Lick his first year as head coach there, coached two years, and he applied for the position. His name was Marvin Wood. And uh, in fact, he was a good friend of uh, Marvin Cave. Is Marvin Cave still here? Does he live here or is he back in Florida? I'm, I saw him in December. What? Either Indianapolis or Florida, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I talked to him back in December, but uh, he coached at uh, Frankfurt at that time, okay, when, when we played here back in 53. Anyway, uh, now it was either a teammate of Marvin Cave or was a good friend of Marvin Cave, one of the two. Anyway, Marvin Wood came from French Lick to Milan. Now, first of all, nobody liked him because he was replacing a guy that everyone did like. So he had, uh, you know, a couple of strikes against him already. And uh, the downtown coaches club, yeah, we had those. <laughs> we met in the barber shop. The, okay. The downtown coaches club, uh, you know, they all had their, their coffee cups hanging on the wall up there with their names on them and so forth. And they met every Monday morning. And uh, they discuss what happened at the basketball game and nothing else. It was either politics or basketball, one of the two, and it, was, it seldom was politics, except election time, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, that changed. Now, when Marvin Wood came, came and, and started, i go, got to go back a little bit because this is also significant. We have 73 boys in high school. 73 boys, 9 through 12. 58 of them came, tried out for his basketball team. 58 out of 73. That's a pretty good percentage. Uh, of, uh, that's how important the guys felt like, that, you know, hey, I, I want to play. I want to play. And he did, had to cut about half of those for a freshman team, uh, a junior varsity team, or JV second team we called it back then, and uh, the varsity. So uh, that was a significant change. Uh, okay, these guys are now juniors in high school. I'm a freshman, and I'm one of those that make the freshman team and the, the second team. Got to play second team and, and freshman as well. But uh, that year, 1952, 1953, we won, I think, in the school history, the third sectional championship. Uh, we go to Rushville for our regional, and we had never won. Milan had never won a regional game. Uh, we won the first game. We won the second game, and that was the regional championship. We go on to the semi-state, which now is played at Butler University, Butler Fieldhouse. Uh, and we ended up playing, uh, a, she was uh, Attica, I believe, was our first opponent there. And then we played Shelbyville, and guess what? We win that. We're now in the final four, four teams left in the state of Indiana. Richmond, uh, Terre Haute, Gershmeyer, uh, South Bend Central, and Milan. Okay, Little Milan, 150 kids in high school <laughs> against those other, other schools, pretty good sized schools. Well, uh, you know, the fairy tale ended at that point. We played South Bend Central in the afternoon and lost. So, uh, you know, it's now, okay, back and reset. Of the team, eight were returning lettermen, two graduated, left a couple of spots on the team for us little rookies, me included. So uh, the next year, 1953-1954, uh, we now have a senior-laden team. Seven seniors, one junior, and two sophomores on the starting on the uh, the ten players. Uh, 
that was a good year. We had bigger teams scheduled. We even came to Frankfurt. We played Seymour. We played uh, Columbus. We played some larger schools to get us ready for the state championship because we're going after it. We were confident that we could play basketball with anybody. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, you know, we could prove that anymore, but we, you know, we, we went through this, the, uh, the tournament schedule. We won the sectional, we won the uh, county tournament, first of all, the sectional, regional. We beat the second, the, the other team that beat us in 53, 54, besides Frankfurt, was Aurora. And Aurora had an excellent basketball team. Uh, in fact, they had three Division I players on that team. Uh, we ended up playing them in the final game of the regional in, at Rushville and won that game uh, in the last quarter. From there, we go back to Butler Fieldhouse for the semi-state, and we ended up playing uh, a team that uh, is known nationally, Crispus Attucks, for the state champion for the semi-state championship. Crispus Attucks had a one player on their team that everybody knows about, uh, Oscar Robertson. Oscar was a sophomore. Oscar was good. He was good as a sophomore. I think he had 15 points after first quarter. I think he ended up with 23 for the game, but we won by 12 or 13 points. Uh, back in the final four. We're back in the final four. Terre Haute Gershmeyer comes back. They were the runner up the year before. A uh, team from Elkhart comes in and Muncie Central. Now, to give a feather in, in Frankfurt's cap, Frankfurt was the only school that beat Muncie Central and Milan that year. <laughs> we had lost two games, and Muncie Central, I think, lost two or maybe three games that year. So Frankfurt was, was the one that put it on both of us, okay? Anyway, <laughs> thought, I'd th thought I'd throw that in for you folks. You're, you're out here kind of sticking your chest out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, we played Terre Haute Gershmeyer in the afternoon and won that game, uh, and it was a tough game, but uh, won that by a dozen, about 12 points, I believe, and that set us up with Muncie Central that night. Muncie Central had won two out of the last three state championships. The year before it was South Bend Central, the two years before that was Muncie Central, Muncie Central. So, Milan goes up against them. Now, there's 15,000 people in Tinkle Fieldhouse or Butler Fieldhouse. Every school was allotted 900 tickets. And we'll give them the benefit of another 100. So, we'll say that 14,000 were for their underdog and 1,000 of them were for Muncie Central, okay, <laughs> that night. Uh, it ended up being a legendary game. Through all of these years, it's called a legendary game uh, because of the way it was played, of the size of schools, and how it ended. Those are the three factors, I think, that, that kind of stands out in everybody's mind, okay? And uh, when you mention Milan, people think, oh, Milan, basketball, okay? Just about like I said a while ago when you mentioned Indiana, basketball. So uh, that's what happened. Uh, the first half, uh, we were up about six points. Third quarter came by, and, uh, and uh, they started catching up. So we started slowing the game down. We ran, into, uh, ran a figure eight kind of an offense, similar to what they're running today, except uh, uh, you know, somewhat different. Uh, anyway. Uh, we slowed the game down third quarter. Uh, they caught up. Score at the end of uh, the third quarter was 26 all. So uh, the fourth quarter starts and they scored the first basket. Now we're behind, first time. We bring the ball down the court, down across the 10 second line and across the 10 second line and we stop. 
and all the players stopped. And Bobby Plump, teammate, is holding the ball. And uh, he stands there, he looks over at the coach, and the coach says, like this. So that meant I'll stay where I am, okay? And he did. The defensive man, Jimmy Barnes, from Muncie Central, was standing about as far as I am from Louis. Uh, not, you know, not quite in guarding distance, but a little bit off of that. And he was standing there this way. And he got tired and he'd be this way. <laughs> and uh, he got tired, he'd be this way, okay? He stood there and we held the ball for four minutes and 17 seconds. Now you think about it, if I stood up here for four minutes, for just four minutes, if I stood up here for a minute and never said a word, you'd, le you'd wonder what's wrong with that guy, okay? Well, there was no action on the floor. It was all in the stands. Pretty soon, the Milan cheering section, and, and we had three cheerleaders, by the way, okay? <laughs> Uh, I, I, I have Butler season tickets, and I go to the Butler ball games, and there are 40-some cheerleaders out there. <laughs> yep. We had three. And you know what? And they started a cheer. We had black uniforms on. That's, I, I, I'm, I'm in school colors today, by the way, okay? Just my uniform. Uh, they said, best teams in the black. Best teams in the black. Best teams in the black. And 14,000 people started. Best teams in the black. <laughs> well, Muncie responded, best teams in the white. Best teams in the white. But they couldn't, you couldn't hear those guys, okay? <laughs> and, you know, it went on like that. All of it was, nobody was going to the concession stand. They were watching down on the floor and nothing was happening. <laughs> They were, you know, we were standing there, Plump was standing there with the ball, holding it just like that. Barnes was still like this. <laughs> I was on the floor at the time. I was playing, and I was over there on the side, you know, doing jumping jacks and things like that, just because I knew sometime we're going to start playing, and it's going to be for real, okay? Well... Uh, with two minutes and some seconds to go, we call timeout. Coach takes me out, puts in a senior who is more experienced than myself and a lot quicker than me. I had, my, my feet are too big to move fast. Anyway, uh, Kenny Wendelman came in and we started a pressing defense. They threw the ball away two or three out of the four or five times they brought the ball down the floor. We intercepted it and so forth. They ended up, uh, we were up, uh, we were up by two points. They scored the, the uh, basket to made it 30 to 30. Yeah, it was a low score because we didn't play much basketball second <laughs> half. We had 23 points at halftime, and now we're go we now have 30. Okay, anyway, uh, score 30 to 30. They score with about uh, 30 seconds to go. We bring the ball down across the 10 second line. We stop, hold it, 18 seconds to go, timeout. Coach sets up a play. We go back on the, oh, uh, coach in the, in the huddle, one of the, one of the players mentioned, let's give the ball to Bob, get out of his way. Uh, I mentioned good athletes a while ago. Those guys were good athletes. They were also good, good students, pretty smart. Uh, that came from a guy by the name of Gene White, who was our center. He was 5'11", <laughs> <laughs> playing against the Muncie Central Center, who was 6'6", okay? And uh, I've got, got to tell you this, because the first time out came in, and, and uh, Whitey says, Coach, he says, I can move him any place you want me to put him. Where do you want me to put him? And he, he was right. I mean, he had big hips, and he knew how to use them. Uh, and he blocked out well, and he played good defense. Uh, for 5'11", uh, he was excellent, okay? But Whitey was also pretty smart. Um, anyway, 
uh, that's what happened. Woody says, okay, here's what we're going to do, guys. Uh, we'll pass the ball. Uh, Ray, you pass the ball into in Gene. And, or, I'm sorry, Ray, you pass the ball into Bobby. I try to get Bob out of this thing, but I can't. Okay. <laughs> Ray, pass the ball into Bobby. The rest of you guys get over to this side of the floor. Bob, wait. Take as much time as you, as you need, but don't leave him any time on the clock. So he lets the clock run down to about nine seconds or so, and he makes a move, and uh, Barnes went from this stance to he lost his jock. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he went around him. He gets as far as the free throw line, and the rest of them begin to converge, and Bob puts it up, and it goes in. And we win. Wow. And we win. Okay. Uh, that's how it was played. And, and because of the size of school, because of uh, the tradition, and because of the way the game was played and all of that, uh, you know, it, it, it's been, I'll tell you what, the Lord blessed me with, uh, with, with lots of blessings. He left me a lot of challenges too, but uh, that has stayed with me uh, all these years, and it was great. Uh, so we ended up with these rings. If you want to see that, I'll, I'll take it off after a while and let you have it, but I got to take it home with me, okay? <laughs> uh, ended up with a trophy. That night uh, in the dressing room down, down and I got to tell you about the celebrations that happened because they're, they're interesting. Uh, in the dressing room that evening, and it was all kinds of reporters there, and finally uh, things begin to clear out, and we finally get to take a shower and, and so forth. Uh, and our, our uh, police escort, Indianapolis po motorcycle police escort, was with us the year before when we were in the Final Four and was with us again. His name was Pat Stark, deceased today. But uh, Pat said, uh, after everything quieted down, he says, what do you guys want to do to celebrate? And somebody piped up, let's go around the circle. <laughs> and... And okay, that's pretty good. But somebody piped in and said, let's go around backwards. <laughs> so everybody goes around the circle this way, right? You know, the roundabouts that are so popular today. Well, that's, that's the circle. So Pat calls ahead to some of his buddies and say, hey, uh, put us up a little ramp because there was a curb on the inside. It isn't today, but it was then. And so we jumped up on the curb and went around the other way. <laughs> now, it would be more significant, you know, this is a change in times. You know why they call it nap town? Because Indianapolis went to sleep at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> and there wasn't anybody on the circle, okay? I shouldn't have told you that, but, uh, but that's almost what happened. There were a few cars that we passed and the horns were blowing and so on and so forth. Uh, but it was, it was a lot of fun. We stay overnight. My wife, uh, then my, my uh, well, just my. <laughs> she wasn't even my girlfriend. What? Anyway, she said when they went home that night, they couldn't get to their house. There were that many people that converged in town. I got to tell you this story because my neighbor in Noblesville called me one day and said, uh, Tony said, uh, hey, Roland, I, I got this guy in my house. He's a good friend. Uh, he said he went to the basketball game that you played in 1954. He said he really wants to meet you. Can I bring him down? Okay. Brought him down. Well, the guy was from Northwest High School right outside of Kokomo. Okay? That's over this direction someplace, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Northwest, right? Okay, he talked his dad. He was a sophomore in high school. Talked his dad into uh, letting him drive the car down to Butler. He and his buddy, so he was 16 years old, uh, he and his buddy went down and, and uh, went to the ball game. And uh, Milan wins. Now, he's from Northwest High School. One of those little schools that I was talking about a while ago. 
at you know Northwest High School for all of those years was trying to do one thing, beat Kokomo in the sectional, right? right. <laughs> so that's why Milan had so many followers because of all of these little schools out there, Milan has all these followers be, and we win and they're all of a sudden on our bandwagon. That's great, okay? So anyway, he comes to the ball game and we win. Now he had to stop at a payphone someplace and we didn't have cell phones back then, remember? Okay. He had to stop at a payphone and called his dad and said, Dad, I'm going to Milan. So he and his buddy did. And there were so many cars and whatever, they just parked their car and started walking. He walk, he was walk, he says, Well, and he said, I can't believe this. He, I was walking across the railroad track and guess who I met? My brother, who watched the game at as he's at his home here near suburban Kokomo, his brother gets in the car and drives to Milan that night. <laughs> she said they were doing the bunny hop and everything around the you know around town and all that stuff. So okay, that was that was Friday or Saturday night. We got home Sunday. We start down the way. First thing we did, by the way, which uh, uh, was very nice. We went to church, first thing we did on Sunday morning. As a team, we all went together. Um, I have to tell you that because it was, it was very significant in all of our lives. We head to Milan, and uh, the, the uh, fire engine picks us up at Batesville, about 20, 25 miles away, and leads us. Uh, and now we have the siren, we're following behind, and we're having fun. Oh, by the way, having fun, as we went through Indianapolis, we had uh, Pat Stark was in front with his motorcycle, and his buddy was in the back with his motorcycle, and they both had their sirens on, and everybody parted <laughs> as we were going. Now, for a 15-year-old kid, that's pretty significant, okay? <laughs> hey, like, whoo, whoo, you know, isn't this great? So that's, that's how that happened, okay? So we get, uh, we get closer to Milan and all these people are pulling off the side of the road because of the siren and because somehow or another, and I don't know why, to this day I don't know why, but there were lots of people that ended up going to Milan that day. Uh, the pull, people pull off, they sit on the fenders. We had fenders back then, remember that? <laughs> Uh, running boards, we had running boards back then too. Uh, and they were, you know, as we went by, they would wave. We get closer to town and now it's car, car, car on both sides of the roads. Uh, we get into town and there's, they estimated 40,000 people in Milan that day. 40,000 people. It was a beautiful Sunday, March 21st afternoon. Beautiful. Temperature probably 60s, in the 60s or whatever. Sun was shining. Great day in a lot of ways, okay? But it was great in the weather-wise as well. So people just came. And all of those people, and a lot of those people from small towns ended up there. 40,000 people in a town of 1,000. Think about it. Uh, we had a little reception in front of the school. They pulled a couple of flatbed uh, trucks up uh, at the entrance of the school and uh, they put chairs on them and they brought us out and uh, you know everybody had to say something. I don't remember what anybody said. I don't remember what I said. It was probably little, very little, and it was probably dumb, okay? I don't know. <laughs> but. But I said it anyway, okay? <laughs> but I don't remember what was said except for one person. Mar uh, Mary Lou Wood, Marvin Wood's wife. They asked her to get up, and she didn't know what to say, but she said this. She said, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And she said, "Am." <laughs> to this day, I think all of us remember exactly what she said. 
and we've tried to use that as our motto as we've grown up and out and, and, and about. Okay, it's been great. Celebrations. I'm way down here someplace, okay? <laughs> we had a bonfire. We went to school the next day. Monday morning, we had school. <laughs> you know, somebody won a sectional one time. They won a sectional. And I, this is when I was coaching, and I remember this. Uh, and they called school off two days in a row to celebrate. <laughs> we won the state championship, our little school, and we had a half day off, okay? <laughs> but we had, to, we had to tell them, okay, if you, we take you home now, you have to come back for the bonfire tonight. We had a bonfire, and I, I stopped and picked up my favorite girlfriend, who happened to be this young lady, and uh, she said that's our that was our first date. Uh, okay, players. We had ten players that dressed for the uh, for the state championship all the way through the, the tournament. Nine of us end up going to college from a small school. That's pretty good. I told you they were not only good athletes, but they were pretty smart. Uh, six of us ended up being coaches or part-time coaches, okay? One ended up in Hollywood. One ended up in, uh, in uh, pro basketball for a while, Bobby Plump. And, uh, and one then went to, went, simply went to work. But he was recruited by Branch for Kraken for two years following that. If you know Bobby Leonard, when Bobby Leonard played for IU, this guy was a spitting image of Bobby Leonard. He was about 6'2", and shot a two-handed set shot just exactly like Bobby Leonard did. And Bobby Leonard played at IU and won a national championship while he was at IU. Uh, Branch McCracken said, hey, I like that guy. I want him. And he said, I don't want you. <laughs> he didn't like the books. He said, I'm glad to get out of high school, and I'm going to stay that way, okay? <laughs> he ended up working for General Motors and uh, worked his way up to uh, uh, a pretty nice position in General Motors. Uh, one didn't, uh, that was the one that didn't go to college. Nine of us graduated. I'm sorry, eight of us graduated from college. Uh, the one that didn't ended up in uh, having a construction company, and uh, so... Six of us ended up being coaches. I coached for a little while, but um, I got smarter after a while, I think. <laughs> My background, I told you, was on a farm. I was a sophomore. I uh, went to Butler. I, I taught. I coached. I uh, spent my year as an educator. And uh, my family, my wife, uh, we have two children. Uh, our daughter is a, uh, an executive director for National Sorority. And our son uh, was a football coach, was a football, co a very successful football coach. Uh, when he was uh, at, Ham he's still at Hamilton Southeastern High School, but uh, uh, did very well when he was there. And uh, he's now retired from coaching, but he's in the counseling profession. And uh, that was also my position. I brought along some books over here. Uh, I just hold them up you can take a look at them when you uh, if you get to the library uh, I don't know why I hold this one up it's Bobby Plump a book about Bobby Plump our teammate and you know I get approached about once a week and say oh you played on Bobby's team <laughs> he's all right oh you played on Bobby's team I said no he played on my team you got a picture of him right there okay <laughs> See what happens? Yeah. I bet you one thing. You don't have my picture on there, do you? Take it now. <laughs> Where? Where am I? <laughs> we'll do a chant. We were. Bobby was on Roland's team. Okay. Well, Bobby was on our team, okay? And. Uh, this is ab about our coach, Marvin Wood, a ball, a ball, a boy, and a dream. Uh, this one, this one is about uh, 
each of the players about the season that we had and each there is a chapter dedicated to each player and if if they stopped the uh, the thing one chapter before they did I wouldn't be in the book okay <laughs> uh, a lady from Carmel wrote this book about the making of the movie Hoosiers and it's kind of interesting uh, the making of the movie Hoosiers now this one came out this is uh, sold at, at uh, many of the uh, bookstores years ago I don't know whether it is anymore or not but uh, it's a DVD of the movie Hoosiers included on that is a an interview with the two guys who wrote it and directed it Pizzo and Anspaugh uh, and there's an interview with them and they talk about how the movie was put together and what they did and so on and so forth by the way they had to cut about uh, almost an hour out of it to make a movie out of it it also contains a DVD of the actual Milan Muncie game uh, there's two DVDs in here okay uh, so that's those are the and I've got some of those pamphlets that uh, Lewis mentioned earlier this is from the Milan Museum there is a museum in Milan today that is very nice for a small town very very nice it's about it's in an old bank building and uh, you walk in and the first thing you see is a safe back there it's as big as those doors you know the big old uh, circular thing on it and uh, but they can't get in it because uh, nobody knows the combination <laughs> anymore. <laughs> anyway the Milan Museum is great and what they did after the movie was made is they now have all of the uniforms that that the Hickory players play uh, war and all of the opponents that Hickory played on their way through so they have those all up and around and they're really neat and there's a lot of neat things that you, you might want to see at the Milan Museum Rollins. yeah what, what happened to Marvin Wood after that championship game okay uh, did you hear the question what happened to Marvin Wood our coach he coached at French Lick two years he coached at Milan two years he left me because I still had two more years to play uh, and uh, I don't know what would have happened we we might have gotten beat in the sectional I don't know but we didn't uh, anyway uh, he went to Newcastle for two years and then he went to North Central of Indianapolis that was a brand new school when he went there and uh, that was 1956 when he went there and he coached there 12 years then he went to Mishawaka and uh, finished his coaching high school coaching there then he went across town and coached the St. Mary's girls team uh, college team okay and he also coached some uh, uh, AAU he passed away in 1999 uh, great gentleman he was just the opposite of Gene Hackman <laughs> Okay, all right. Let's, let's check my notes here. And see what I need to do. How do you remember that date that you won? Do I remember what? How do you remember the date that you won the state? How I remember? That? Well, it was my birthday that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, what a sixteen-year-old kid. What are, What do they want most when they get to me? Turn sixteen. What do they want to do? Drive. 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 Okay. And the, and the BMV, Bureau Motor Vehicles, was open on Saturday. My birthday was on a Saturday. I didn't get a go <laughs> because we were playing basketball that day, okay? And that was more important, and it was, okay? I finally got to take, get my license about three Saturdays later, okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, it was kind of neat. Uh, the, the, the movie Hoosiers, I got to tell you a little bit about how all that started. 
uh, two guys uh, in the uh, uh, theater division of uh, studying theater at IU. One was from Bloomington, the other was from Decatur. And uh, probably over a couple of beers, I don't know, but uh, one of them looked at the other and said, you know, wouldn't it be nice to make a David and Goliath movie about Hoosier basketball? And the other guy said, you write it and I'll direct it. Now, they both wanted to go to Hollywood, and they both ended up going to Hollywood. And that was 1970, which was 54 through 70, 16 years later when that happened. 13 years later, Angelo Pizzo, with a writer, says, looks up David Anspaugh and says, here it is, I got it, the script for this movie. First of all, they had to come up with a, a name, and they called it Hoosiers. And, uh, and those two guys were responsible for a low, low, low-budget film. <laughs> okay. I passed the sign that says Terhune, three miles on the way up here. <laughs> well, there aren't very many people in Terhune that can, then can reap, uh, what do they call those when you get uh, money back from... from Royalties. There aren't many people in, in Trahune that can get a royalty, right? So they used the word, the name Trahune. That was one of the teams that, that Hickory played, okay? I had a copy of the script before they made the movie. Now, I don't know anything about scripts. I didn't teach English. Uh, obviously, you probably gathered that when I was talking. Uh, but... Uh, I read the I read the script. Uh, it, I know it's pretty, pretty exclusive, you know, and all that kind of stuff in it. And I got done and I laughed. I laughed. I said, you know, I broke out laughing. She said to me, "What are you laughing about?" I said, "Hey, first of all, you take the word hickory and shorten it. What do you get? Hick. You get a hick." Now, I grew up close enough to Kentucky to know what a hick is, okay? <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that didn't turn me on very much, and, uh, and they never used Milan as a name. Uh, none of that because, as I said a while ago, it was a low-budget film. They brought four people in from Hollywood and one from Chicago, to play the big parts in that movie. The rest of them were all people. You guys had a movie made here. Yep. Blue Chips. Blue Chips. Uh -huh. uh, what was it, 1990? 92. Somewhere in the 90s, okay. I bet they used a whole lot of, a lot of, were, you were there. Aha, ha, ah, you were. Bobby Knight for two nights. Yes, I did. Okay. Super. Well, I'm sitting right behind Bobby Knight in one of the shots with my yeah. my son-in-law, my daughter, and I, and they do it. And it's like no, there we were. <laughs> well, <laughs> for the movie uh, for the movie Hoosiers, uh, Hack Hackman. Spent a week and a half with Bobby Knight to learn how to, you know, to how to be, how a coach behaves. <laughs> he finally found out how a coach behaves. Marvin Wood was nothing like that. Okay, uh, so they, you know, they, they uh, found out, you know, to be a successful movie, you have to have drama, you have to have conflict, you have to have sex, you have to have all of these things that that go into that, and. And Piso did his homework. He went to Milan. He went to neighboring schools. He went to, uh, all over the place to do his research. And he came up with one conclusion. He said, I can't make a movie about Milan. I can't make a movie about these guys. They are too vanilla, too plain. And, you know, we, we probably were, okay? We may not have had the best players in that final four in 1954. 
We may not have had the best players, but we had the best team. Even though we didn't, we weren't six six, and you know could take the, uh, the the quarter off the top of the backboard or whatever. We we weren't like that, but we had the best team. Um, gosh, I think I've hit it all. Now, you had a question. Anybody else have a question or comment? Yes, sir. Well, you mentioned Turkin. Ulu Lytic was also in the. Yes. Were any of those people oh. entitled to any loyalty? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have a good friend of mine who was a uh, basketball official, a very successful basketball official in Indiana, uh, Jerry Larison, passed away about two weeks ago. Uh, he was the one in the movie. He was in the movie. He's the one that gave uh, Gene Hackman a tech. Uh, that was a friend of mine uh, that passed away. Uh, I asked him uh, several years ago. In fact, I talked to him maybe two months ago. And uh, I said, hey, have you ever gotten any money? He said, uh, yeah, it, about 24 cents one day. <laughs> yeah. Ray Kraft was in the movie. Yes. Ray, who was coached here at Clinton Central. Uh, and I asked Ray the same thing, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, Ray said, uh, I got 17 cents one time. Mm -hmm. So the movie made the Milan story international. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just Indiana. So what's happened in basketball in Indiana? Uh, in the 60s, we'd, we did consolidations. We ended up with Clinton Central, Clinton Perry, and all those schools, Western okay? Lawrence, and we kind of took away from some of the towns. Uh, McCutcheon out here took away from Lafayette, uh, the same way with Harrison did as well, okay? But and, and then there were some counties that the entire county went together with one school. Uh, Jennings County, Milan stayed like they were. School board said, if those guys can do it, we, ex we think we give these other guys a chance to do it too, to win the state championship. Uh, that didn't happen, but you know, that, that was their call. Um, so basketball has changed because of consolidations in the 60s, 70s. Uh, then in the late 90s, we brought in class basketball. And that changed basketball from this standpoint. It, it no longer is a statewide thing where, where the entire state recognizes the champion, but it be, it's a local thing. Okay, we're localities. If, if uh, who was it was telling me that uh, Prairie won a volleyball championship here? Uh, okay, uh, if uh, volleyball is not a class sport, is it? It is. Yeah, it is. Okay, they have four four divisions there, just like basketball. Anyway, uh, it, it's change it. Local people recognize that volleyball team. Local people will recognize uh, Clinton Central if they win a state championship. They play tonight. I'm going to watch Hamilton Southeastern because I have a good friend whose daughter plays on the Southeastern team. My, my son and daughter-in-law coach in, uh, or excuse me, teach and work in the Hamilton Southeastern District. So we're going to the ball game tonight for the girls. Sir. Even in the 70s, I grew up in Winchester, which is less than half the size of Frankfurt. Uh, but uh, the Newcastle Regional was what Randolph County had to go through every year in, in the 70s. So Newcastle Regional was Newcastle School, Muncie School, Richmond. A and we realized in Randolph County, no matter who won the the sectional of Randolph County, because it still remained five high schools. We had to face one of those. The best year we ever had, we, we beat Hammond one year in a holiday tourney, and it was our hope to be there with the David versus Goliath. 
We faced uh, Sam Grummer in Muncie Central in the afternoon game and won that one. But we faced Steve Alford and Newcastle in the evening game. And uh, well, that did, we ended losing by two points. And of course, all, that was the year Newcastle won the state. Yeah. But there was always the hope through even through the 70s that, that David could face Goliath and had a chance. <laughs> Every year, thank you, every year in March, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Indiana, by the way, was, uh, was uh, uh, instrumental in coming up with the March Madness saying, mm -hmm. the Final Four saying, the uh, Sweet 16 saying. I don't think we came up with, this, with the Elite Eight, but uh, those were, were names that, that were spread about because basketball in Indiana was the leader throughout the nation. Everybody looked at uh, James Naismith, the originator in Springfield, ended up in uh, Kansas, coaching in Kansas basketball in the, in the uh, early 1900s. Uh, and the other guy, uh, his, one of his protégés, ended up at, at Crawfordsville. So that's how Kansas and Indiana have kind of, you know, uh, and, and then it's North Carolina has picked it up. So you can say that those three states, now Kentucky is in there too, okay? And Tennessee's trying to get there. Uh, so uh, basketball is spread, but there's no way, no way we could play basketball the way we played and play today. Uh, they are bigger, faster, stronger. Uh, we never lifted a weight. We wouldn't even cut our fingernails <laughs> on game day because it threw off our shot. I think Plump said that, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Plump owns a. Uh, he was he was the one that ended up uh, in business. He ended up in insurance. He uh, also played pro basketball for the Phillips Oilers back uh, when he graduated from Butler. Played for them a couple of years until he got uh, his chest caved in, and and uh, then he went into selling insurance. But uh, and Eve is sat here, uh, smiling because uh, the, there was probably a uh, an opponent of of your insurance organization, right? <laughs> Way beyond. Okay. Anyway, he owns a his son runs at uh, a restaurant in Indianapolis. It's called Plump's Last Shot. Plump's Last Shot. Now, everybody knows it as Plump's Last Shot, but I know it as Plump's Lucky Shot, okay? <laughs> because, uh, you know, when they were filming the movie, the guy that played that part, Shooter, uh, can't think of his name now. Anyway, the guy that played Dennis, that part. Dennis Hopper. No. Uh, uh, this was, this was. Chitwood, oh, Joey Chitwood, yeah. The guy, he was putting him up, putting him up from, from that very spot where he shot and couldn't hit. And the audience was just getting, you know, you know they were ho-hum, you know, just like <laughs> booing him. <laughs> and when he hit one, guess what they did? They, you know, everybody got up and cheered because they could now go home. It was like 11 <laughs> o'clock at night. They could now go home. And you know what? That got into the movie, okay? <laughs> that scene, they didn't cut that one. It got into the movie. You had a question. Yeah, the, uh, I know for many years your team got together at, uh, during the state finals. Do you still get together with your teammates? We have a reunion every year. Okay, still do that, good. Mm -hmm. uh, Marvin Wood, uh, Coach Wood said, uh, you know what? We're going to lose track of each other once we leave here, and that's the last time. And uh, uh, I'll tell you another story in just a second. Uh, but uh, we get together every year. The first couple of years we got together at his place, and now we change around and, and everybody hosts that and so forth. Uh, but uh, we, we stay in touch. We have two people that are deceased. Uh, we had one of our players that went to the University of Houston, coached in Texas, won a state championship in Texas.
became an administrator in a school, and he has a school. He's now deceased, been deceased since 1988. Uh, he has a school named after him in Houston, Texas, the Ronnie Truett Junior High School. A uh, great guy, okay? Uh, Bob Engel is deceased. He was the one that was injured, uh, and I played for during the state tournament. And uh, Bob was the one that did not go to college. Uh, he ended up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and working for General Motors up in, in um, whatever town that is. Kalamazoo, I guess. Okay. Uh, rest of us are still here. Uh, the good Lord has blessed me with uh, a good life. Uh, it didn't just start or stop at that point in March 20th, 1954. It's gone on. Uh, he's put out many challenges for me. And uh, we've met most of those. And, uh, and uh, you know, hey, you've been great. Anybody else have a question? Be happy to answer a question. Well, isn't it true that one other uh, high school represented in the movie Hoosiers, they don't call them. The last scene is a picture of the Indiana State champs but it doesn't say 1954. It says 1952. Yeah. The actual state champion for 1952, I believe, was Christmas Attucks. No, Muncie Central. Or Muncie Central, okay. Christmas but Attucks, yeah. Christmas Attucks is represented because the coach of South Bend Central was Ray Crow. Ray Crow, correct. Who, who was coach of Christmas Attucks. Correct, correct, yeah. Uh, Attucks won it in 55. And lost one game. They won in 56, lost one game. They were undefeated, first undefeated team, first black team in a nation that won a state championship, Christmas Addicts. They had a great bunch of players. It wasn't just Oscar, okay? Right. Right. Uh, they won it again in 59 uh, with a new coach. So, you know, Ray Crow was, was a short term coach, but uh, very effective, <coughs> very effective. He had a great job. Uh, I was going to tell you another story, but I don't remember what it was. Uh, age, age factor, I guess, okay? <laughs> All right. Hey, you've been great. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. I even came in uniform today. My, my colors, our colors at Milan were black and gold. Thank you. Here.